be put away. There are a lot of stipulations placed on the husband, especially one who desires to be an elder, and he must be faithful to every one of them. The qualifications that the Bible speaks of will read the same in the day of judgment as they read today. We find out that as we look at his marriage, if you are waiting for the perfect marriage, there's only one. Christ to his church. Yes, yes, Ephesians 5 yes, and verse number 27. Yes, that he may present it unto himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle yes. and without blemish. Yes. That's the kind of uh, bride that Christ is looking for when he returns. If we commit ourselves to following God's word when it comes to marriage, we will remain with the one woman that we marry until death. The question we are dealing with really amounts to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And as we view marriage today, we find that times have changed, but the Bible has not. God said, I am the Lord. I do not change. Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 6. Jesus Christ the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 8. And I realize that many of you may think that what I'm about to say is just my opinion. And for this very reason, I shall conscientiously determine to be exact, extremely factual in presenting the scriptures. After all, who needs opinions when you have the word of God? When it comes to marriage, some say that the elder is to be a one-woman man. And I understand what they're trying to say. This does not mean one woman at a time. We are to be faithful to the one we married initially. She is the one woman. And if you have a second wife, that means that your first wife is deceased or that she was unfaithful. Those are the only two scriptural reasons that you have for divorce. There are some who believe that even after a man's wife dies, he is not qualified if he marries another sister. I remember being in a congregation and a, a woman said that uh, to her husband that if she passed away that he would not be able to be an elder again, that he would just have to step down. Well, that's not in teaching with what the scripture says. Who are we to place restrictions where there are or none placed scripturally? It's not for us to change the word of God again, but for the word of God to change us. His word on the matter is the final authority, whether we agree with it or not. Now, there are those who will say that a man may repent of his sin and be forgiven of them, and that's true. God does forgive sins, but a man doesn't truly repent if he does not change. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 10, the Israelites, after they came back from being in bondage, and they went back to Jerusalem, and they began to marry foreign wives. This thing was something that displeased the Lord, and not only did it displease the Lord, but it displeased Ezekiel. To the point that in Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel told them that they must put away their foreign wives and also their children. They had to get rid of those things that was unpleasing to the Lord. God means what he says, even though we may not always understand. There are times, or many things rather, that cause couples to dissolve marriages. But we have to realize and teach that there's only one reason scripturally, according to the scripture, for divorce. Divorce is never you know, if we teach in our congregations, then perhaps our young men will not mess up their lives at an early age so that whenever they become older men, when the church is looking for men to be leaders in the church, they don't have that spot by their name. They don't have that asterisk by their name. They could be leaders and be proud to be leaders because they've kept the commandments of God. Find that this man, the husband of one wife, he has a duty to God, as well as all of us, of course. 
But when it comes to a divorce, the Bible says that God hates divorce. In Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 16. Now, I know the King James Version doesn't read that way. It reads putting away. God hates to put it away. But the New King James Version and other reputable translations read it that God hates divorce, which is exactly what it amounts to. Death is the only way that marriage can be dissolved without sin being by one or both parties. That's it. Death is the only way. In other words, if a divorce takes place and it's not because of death, then somebody is seeing. Yes, sir. Or both of them have seen. If the husband loves his wife like Christ loves the church, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 23, we wouldn't have to preach sermons like, like this. Yes, it has been said that murder destroys lives while divorce destroys families. Some think that it's okay to divorce as long as I don't marry again. The scripture says again that God hates divorce. Some want to look at Moses as the Pharisees did in the book of Matthew chapter 19 and say that Moses allowed divorce. But Moses is not my example. Jesus Christ is my example. I'm not worshiping under the law of Moses. I am under the law of Christ. And we all have a duty to God and to our spouses also. We made a vow to our spouses before God. There are some who say that if I divorce my wife, I have to have another one. And that's not necessary. You may have just chose to become a eunuch for the kingdom of God. If we just simply obey the will of God and strive to be pleasing in his sight and strive to do what God wants us to do, then we won't have these problems and have to preach these kind of sermons. You know, in my conclusion, and I'll give some time back, you know, when you uh, begin to preach and you write out these sermons and you get up and you start thinking, you say, well, you know, I don't even need all the time until you start talking as a preacher. And you find out you need more time than you actually thought you did. But I don't need more time. I, in, in my conclusion, I, I was talking with my wife about this subject. And, and this is the question that I, that I asked her. I said, uh, honey, I said, if a man who is an elder, and he marries a woman, well, he has to be married, and the woman dies, should he step down as an elder? Her answer was indicative of what many in the Lord Church feel. She felt that he should not because it's already proved that he could be an elder. That sounds good. However, the qualifications state that he must be the husband of one wife. It is a continuous qualification. The qualifications don't readjust themselves to fit our situations. It's, it's said that he must be married. Now answer this question is what I told her. If his wife dies, is he still married? Is he still married? If his wife dies, is he still the husband of one wife? I know that's a hard pill to swallow. Because we, we look at men and we think that you know, this man is experienced. This man has been doing this for a long time. Why, why should he have to step down? Let me give you another illustration, and maybe this will help a little bit. If a man has a license to drive a car, he's been driving for 30 years, but he loses his license for alcoholism or drunk driving or whatever. He loses his license. Can he still legally operate a motor vehicle? He must maintain his license in order to legally drive in any state that he drives in. Yeah. He knows how to do it. Yeah. He's been doing it for 30 years. Uh -huh. But legally, he has to maintain a driver's license continually to, keep, to continue to be able to drive legally in any state that he drives in. Amen. It's the same thing that whenever you uh, take a plane and you get on a plane you may be a frequent flyer who flies all the time. And every time you get on that plane and 
you sit down in the seat, and they're ready to uh, take off. Before they take off, here comes the steward. And they've got the seatbelt demonstration. And you've seen that a thousand times. You know how to put it on, but they're going to show it to you anyway. Because they, that's their job, to continually show you what you must do. And the scripture is the same way. It does not change. I love the fact that the Bible was written in Koine Greek, which is not a spoken language anymore. Therefore, men can't change it. There are words that we change in our everyday vernacular. We change words. Gay doesn't mean what it used to mean a long time ago because people have went back and changed it. But you can't change the word of God because it's not a spoken language anymore. God knew what he was doing when he wrote the word. Well, I'll tell you, it's a beautiful thing when you, when you study the word of God and you see the mind of God in the word of God. God knew that changes would come about and people would begin to change. Just like Brenda spoke of how people are changing in the church today. They don't like something and they change it. And this is the kicker. When they change what they don't like, they expect God to like what they like. But God already told us what he liked and God expects us to follow what it is he wants us to follow. But they will change their mind and then they want God to accept what they change it to. They want God to feel the same way they feel. But they're going to be in serious trouble in the day of judgment, if they don't repent. I always tell people when I preach, congregation where I, where I am, there's only one sin that'll send you to hell. Only one sin that'll send you to hell. And that's an unrepentant sin. That's an unrepentant sin. Jesus said if you die and you have sin in your life, where I am, there you cannot come. We have sin in our lives. Brethren, we need to every day be on our knees in prayer. And I know that Brenda talked about these men, and certainly, well, they need to be talked about, but certainly they need to be prayed for also. Because they are our brothers, they are in Christ, even though they are erring brothers. The scripture tells us what to do on that behalf too. We pray for them, that they may gain the knowledge or use the knowledge that they have. I found out that a lot of these young men come out of denominational schools. They go and get doctorate degrees and they go and get master degrees in denominational school. And because they have not been taught properly in the church before they went off to these schools, yeah. then they cannot handle the doctrine when they get there. Yeah. And so they wind up changing their mind about church doctrine, and now they feel that the church has been wrong all these years. Lord, and that the Baptists were actually right. Huh. And that the Methodists were actually right. Great. And we can fellowship with them and inner fellowship with them. The but again... I could applaud the brethren these days and this kind of lectureship because we get to tell it like it is. I remember one preacher, uh, his, his, that was his subject title, tell it like it is. And I remember before he started, he said, brother, I must remind you, there's a lot to tell. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding in these days. But that's the end of my message, and God bless you. Amen. Amen. Let church say amen. Let church say amen again.